Hello, everyone, and welcome to Human Rights in Business 202, a training developed in partnership with BSR and Business Call to Action. This is actually our third training, our first one, Human Rights 101, an introduction to human rights, our second one, Human Rights 202, looking at the food, beverage, and agriculture sector. And this third training is focused on the consumer goods sector. We're glad to have you with us. As a note, please make sure to keep yourself on mute unless you have a question. We're happy to take questions um, by uh, you coming off of mute or by using the chat function at the bottom right of your screen. The training here will cover four different issues that are relevant for the consumer goods sector. Forced and child labor, working conditions, bribery and corruption, women's empowerment. And each area provides an overview of the issue, some cases and examples of how um, this issue may arise uh, in business world, and what you can do about it, some tips, tricks, and guidance on how to address these issues in your operations and your supply chain. To give you a little bit of context, um, myself, I'm a manager at Business for Social Responsibility. We're a nonprofit organization um, that works with companies on human rights issues, as well as a range of other sustainability issues. Um, my colleague, Peter Nestor, is a director of our human rights practice. And between the two of us, we have worked on human rights issues for 10 plus years and um, worked with a number of companies on how to improve their human rights practices, how to identify issues within their operations and their supply chain, um, but also how to set strategy and develop goals for how to better integrate human rights. We're partnering on this webinar series with Business Call to Action. Um, and I would like to take a second to let Nazila talk a little bit about Business Call to Action uh, and introduce herself. So Nazila, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Michaela. Hello, everyone. Very welcome to this, uh, this class. Uh, I'm delighted to see uh, some of you familiar, I'm familiar with and I've been working with. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself and share a few words about the Business Calls Action for the ones of you that are not familiar with uh, our work and our platform. So first of all, I'm the lead at the Business Call to Action for Knowledge Management and Partnerships. Um, and the Business Call to Action is a global inclusive business platform advancing core business solutions for development. So we work with inclusive businesses, businesses that are both um, commercially sustainable but also trying to advance um, the sustainable development goals. Um, our 200 plus members um, have pledged to provide access to financial services to five, um, so 59 million people, improve access to healthcare for 617 million people, and has access to energy for over 18 million homes and, and much more. So here you can see some of these figures. Uh, we have a very diverse membership uh, that includes different sectors, different company types, uh, including multinationals, but also small and medium-sized enterprises. And we're also covering um, over 60 countries globally. Um, just a few words also on, on, on this interest to work on uh, human rights. As you, you know, uh, this, um, this year is marking the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and we were really keen to take this opportunity to work with our members uh, to identify, exchange, and promote best practices and lessons learned on the promotion of respect of human rights. Um, we're delighted uh, to be collaborating with BSR on this, and we hope that uh, you will enjoy um, today's class. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nazila. And on our next, we have a little bit of information about the business. Nazila, if, um, if you'd like to share a little bit about the business from the business call to action perspective um, and a little bit about the company that would be great. Yes, sure. Um, so what is an inclusive business? So an inclusive business, as I just mentioned, uh, is defined as a commercially viable business model that benefits low-income communities. So we define these communities as um, communities living, people living with less than $10 per day and purchasing power parity. Um, and these companies are basically integrating, including 
these communities on the value chain as part of the value chain as clients, consumer, producers, entrepreneurs, and employees. So here, the little figure at the bottom left, you can see um, this value chain, and you can see um, how low-income population can be included um, and how most of these companies are working with them. Um, an inclusive business is also aligning business value with social impact, societal impact, and of course, they also adhere to uh, responsible environmental, social, and governance standards. Um, that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nazila. Thank you. All right. At this point, we're going to dive into the material here, and I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Peter. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Michaela, for uh, getting us started, and thanks, Nazila, for that uh, uh, great overview of Business Call to Action. As Michaela mentioned, my name is Peter Nestor. I'm uh, Director of Human Rights at, uh, at BSR and uh, very pleased to be working on this content. Um, so we have a few slides here, uh, as Michaela mentioned earlier, um, where we will go through um, a number of issues that come up in the consumer goods context. Uh, it's not going to be exhaustive, and um, we would welcome this opportunity to talk with you about any issues that you might uh, have or any questions that you might have about what a potential human rights issue is in your business or in your supply chain. Um, and so, uh, so don't, please don't hesitate to, uh, to come in. I'll pause for questions as we, as we work through the material, but um, uh, it, would be, it would be really good to hear uh, anything that, uh, that you'd like to ask. Um, as Michaela mentioned, I've been working on uh, human rights issues with businesses for seven years, and so I'm happy to spend our hour together uh, going through our content, but then working through um, whatever, whatever, you might, uh, whatever questions you might have. All right, so what is a human rights violation? Um, there are a lot of different kinds of human rights violations. Some people uh, think that it could be quite broad, um, and in many cases, though, it is quite well-defined, uh, exactly what a human rights violation is. If you did not join us, last week we uh, recorded a, an intro to business and human rights that's now available up on the Business Call to Action website with the slides, um, with the slides there. I would encourage you to go back and look at that. We talk a lot more about the history of human rights and business and human rights, and so today we're just going to focus on a few on a few issues for the you know primarily for consumer goods uh, companies. These three pictures here are intended to show uh, the range of human rights issues. So if we click through this, you know we can say is definitely a human rights violation, right? If you find a, a child, uh, clearly a child working. Uh, in the field, um, you know, and potentially doing backbreaking work like picking cotton, like this, um, like this girl is uh, from Uzbekistan. Uh, we, you know, the prohibition on child labor is is obvious um, is obviously a human rights issue, and it's something that is prohibited in uh, in almost every country. Now, if she was a little bit older, you know, say 12 or 13, 14. Um, it does start to get a little bit more complicated there. And we'll use one of our case studies a little bit later um, to talk about some work that one company is doing to educate farmers in rural communities around child labor and around what is acceptable and uh, may not be acceptable. Um, it's not always unacceptable, right? There are opportunities for kids to work on farms and to learn how to do farming, but, um, but there is a line. And, um, and so, you know that that is uh, part of the trick of navigating. All right, when am I when am I involved in something that's a human rights issue, and when am I not? This particular picture, this one is definitely a human rights violation. This, of course, is the uh, the tragic Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh, and this is also a human rights violation. There was um, an enormous loss of life, um, but even leading up to the factory collapse, there was. Um, there were human rights violations that were happening uh, inside the factory in terms of, um, you know, low payment of wages, poor working conditions. Uh, there may have been some human trafficking going on where people are uh, not free to leave. Um, they're not free to leave their, uh, uh, their work. Um, so this one we can we can pretty clearly say if you had if you had seen this this would be a human rights violation. 
Um, but these pictures, you know, appear to be people who are just at their work doing, um, doing, uh, doing their job. But there may be some human rights issues going on in these pictures as well. Um, one reason is because they're coming from uh, some, uh, you, you know, some high-risk uh, countries. Um, the first is obviously a group of women working on a in a garment factory. The second is a uh, man working on a um, uh, potentially a small-scale mining operation um, in Africa. And even though it looks like they are uh, sort of just doing their jobs. They might, again, not be getting paid very well. They might be in debt to a certain, to, to a particular person, which I misspoke earlier, just being in debt to someone is not necessarily human trafficking, but more a sign of uh, forced labor, um, which oftentimes is connected to human trafficking. Um, and so this is why it's important to um, conduct due diligence um, in terms of your operations. And that's, and that's what the guiding principles uh, that we'll talk about in a minute um, that's what they um, that's what they encourage companies to do. We have to get out there and start asking these questions, and we have to get out there and you know go to the high risk mar uh, uh, markets, talk to high risk businesses that are all over our value chain, and uh, and try to figure out a little bit more about what's going on. So when you think about human rights, I would point you to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, it was signed 70 years ago, um, and it is as we say here on the second bullet point, the foundational document. Uh, around establishing human rights in the in the modern world, um, the best way to think about it is moving back up to the top of the slide here. That human rights are a basic code of conduct for all human beings, right? Regardless of where you're born, this is the document that says, um, regardless of who you are, what country you're from, you have the right to life, you have the right to good working conditions, you have the right to join a union, you have the right to be free from discrimination. Uh, throughout society, but also in the workplace. You have the right to be uh, free from uh, child labor, you know, right to, to not, to, to, to go, to have an education. You have a right to an education. You have a right to basic um, uh, health needs, uh, a right to nutrition, a right to food, a right to water. Um, so we're not getting at anything that's too, that's too far out here, right? This is not like, um, this is not like you have all the rights under the world. Uh, to any kind of luxury item that you want. What we're talking about is the right to basic needs and, uh, and basic, um, uh, basic uh, things in society that, um, uh, that are needed to live a full, a full life. The uh, UN Guiding Principles were passed in um, 2011. Actually, the full name is UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Uh, and they provided a blueprint for companies to start to get into this conversation around respecting human rights. For 70 years, it had been primarily countries that were responsible for passing laws that would protect people's human rights. Uh, countries do that in a lot of different ways, and we talk about that in the 101 training. What we're focused on here is um, what is the corporate responsibility to respect? And primarily, it's to do a number of, it's to do a number of things inside your company, adopt a policy, make sure that people know about uh, human rights, and what we're going to go through today is conducting due diligence on your business partners and on your own operations. And so what kinds of issues are going to come up during that due diligence if you particularly are a consumer goods uh, company? That, is, uh, that will be the focus uh, for, today's, for today's class. All right, excuse me. So the first one, um, is uh, something we've been talking about already a little bit, but forced and uh, forced and child labor. Um, this uh, so the slides we've got these set up as um, consistent throughout the throughout the deck. So we'll talk about which industry it's in, why it happens, roughly exactly what it is, give a couple examples, and then um, mm -hmm. uh, point you to some questions that you can ask to uh, to investigate whether or not this might be happening in your own supply chain. So uh, forced labor, prevalent in the cotton industry, also found in other raw materials, including palm oil, uh, palm oil and cocoa. Um, consumer goods manufacturing sites also have a risk of forced labor, exact, uh, especially on, uh, on garment sites. Some of you might be familiar with a scheme that was run in India called the Sumangali scheme. Uh, it was a number of years ago that this was kind of uncovered and a number of 
companies were trying to be proactive about educating their suppliers in India and, um, and not participating in this scheme. And it was basically a scheme to um, coerce primarily female workers uh, into the supply chain and into these factories under horrible working conditions and, uh, and, and not paying them adequately. Um, the core definition of forced labor um, from the ILO is that it's uh, forced or compulsory labor that is all work or service extracted from any person under threat of a penalty and for which the person has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. Um, basically, what that means is that if you are not able to freely walk away from your job um, without threats or penalties, then uh, you are being forced to work. The key element is to think about the ability to get up and walk away uh, whenever you want. You know, so this doesn't necessarily mean, and we were talking about this on our agriculture call last week, that one of the problems with forced labor is this is often tied to a term uh, that you may have heard called modern slavery. And it's, it's a form of modern slavery. There are a lot of other forms of modern slavery as well. Um, but one of the problems with using the term modern slavery is that we often think that we are looking for slaves. We're looking for people who are chained up and who are being, you know, whipped by uh, somebody sort of following them in the field like we used to see 200 years ago. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. Forced labor is a form of modern slavery. So if this woman in this picture here, um, uh, you know, is being somehow coerced into being there. Maybe her paychecks are withheld or she owes a lot of money back to someone because she has paid enormous recruiting fees. Um, then it, then we could say that she cannot stand up and freely walk away. And so that is, uh, potentially a form of, of forced labor. What we've got here on the bottom are a few examples, confinement to a workplace or a limited area. Um, so maybe the doors are locked, uh, when you come on the site or maybe, um, as we've in the second one here, debt bondage, paying excessive recruiting fees. Number three is uh, withholding wages or excessive wage reduction. Uh, number four is retention of passports or identity documents. And number, number five is forced overtime. So setting sales quotas that are too high, or if you think about calling in a call center, set those quotas and requirements so high that you unintentionally have to be, you have to stay overtime to finish, uh, to finish the work. A couple examples recently from the news. Um, we've talked a little bit here. I'm going to start from the bottom up. Cotton in Uzbekistan has been a big issue, um, and a lot of consumer goods companies, primarily clothes manufacturers who source cotton that, make, that comes from Uzbekistan, have been very concerned about this issue. Um, and there have been several multi-stakeholder efforts to, um, to correct this and to work with the government of Uzbekistan to, um, to try to fix this problem. In the garment sector, we talked uh, about sort of the Sumangali scheme and several other situations where forced labor has come up in the garment scheme, uh, primarily in Southeast Asia, India, um, and, uh, and you know, other parts in that, of, of that part of the world. But it can happen everywhere as well, including in my country, in the United States. There have been um, uh, several, several investigative reports around forced labor in Los Angeles or in New York in the garment districts there. So. If you're doing business in a country that is generally considered low risk from a human rights standpoint, it doesn't mean that there are no human rights issues there. Uh, this can, you know, this is really a, a, an industry-wide uh, issue. The last one I wanted to point out here is prison labor, in, which has been a problem in China. And the, the trick there is that, um, it, um, is that it's very difficult to, to justify using prison labor uh, where you don't, where you, uh, don't pay them or treat these people horribly. And again, this is coming back to their human right, um, to dignity and to uh, be treated fairly, even if they are uh, in prison. You have to provide them with some compensation for their work, um, and you obviously cannot physically abuse them. Uh, but again, even though they are in prison. Um, and so that, that's kind of a weird one. Some people have a hard time thinking about, well, these are prisoners, right? Aren't they just part of the state and they can do whatever we tell them to do? They can, but they also have human rights as well. So um, if you're sourcing, you know, this has been a problem, a known problem in China, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a problem elsewhere too. So um, keep an eye out for uh, any 
any, any time that you see prison labor, raise a red flag uh, and just make sure that, um, that you're asking good questions about whether they're being treated well. All right, some questions that, uh, that you can ask. Um, do the workers have possession of their identity and travel documents at all times? Um, and tell us, you know, if you're, if you're interrogating the supplier, you're investigating the supplier, how, do, how can you show that they have possession of their documents at all times? Um, what systems do you have in place to protect them? Um, are the workers or is the business using a recruitment agency? Uh, not all recruitment agencies are bad. Many of them are, and many of them are charging uh, excessive uh, fees and basically indebting these people to, to the owner of these recruiting um, organizations for the rest of their lives. Uh, to give you a sense, um, you know, there's been documented cases of this in, um, in uh, Taiwan recently, believe it or not, uh, primarily in the second and third tiers of some major, uh, some major uh, brands and factories that are sourcing to major brands, Coca-Cola, Patagonia, um, uh, New Balance, others, where as they've done the investigation, they've found that these workers are paying, you know, they're in debt, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 uh, US dollars, but they are only making about 500 US dollars per month. Now that has to go to, you know, um, their own well-being, uh, their, you know, food and shelter. Often they're sending money back home. Often they're coming from Southeast Asia. So these are usually Vietnamese people, Malaysian people, Indonesian people who are migrating up to Taiwan uh, to do work. Um, but what they end up having to do is pay a number of their, uh, is pay a lot of that salary into paying down $4,000, uh, $5,000 worth, uh, worth of debt. And so uh, it adds up very quickly. There's interest on that debt and they're, you know, very soon they're not making any money but they also cannot leave because they have not paid off this debt. So the recruitment fees is a really important question to, to think about and ask. Um, and we, uh, and there are some, some good resources that we can point you to, to learn more about that. The last bullet point here is around uh, whether a contract has been signed or not. Um, lack of a contract usually means that an employer has more control over a worker and can use that influence and control sometimes in ways that are not uh, that are not uh, good for the worker. So make sure that all, so make sure that all the workers you know that you're uh, of the company that you're asking for do have contracts. We've got some resources here. Uh, we'll post this uh, we'll post this slide deck on the website um, shortly. Uh, and feel free to go to go through these resources on recruiting specifically. Uh, before we move into child labor here, I would just point you to an organization called the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Uh, they've set up a group called the Leadership, um, the Leadership Group on Responsible Recruitment. So basically large multinational companies uh, who are um, committed to working on this recruitment fee issue in their supply chains and committing to paying and investigating their supply chain to make sure that there are no, no fees that are paid uh, anywhere in their supply chain. So a lot of good work um, going on there. Uh, let me pause here for a second before we get into child labor and just see if uh, anyone might have any questions or anything to add. I realize we, we have some other experts on the call here who, um, might, uh, who might have something else to say about, uh, about forced labor specifically. Uh, I'll just pause here for about five seconds. Hi, uh, I have a comment. This is Kanesh Negi. In a lot of countries, uh, the overseas recruiters, uh, they are in form of a big industry. They've almost taken shape of a kind of a mini industry. And they do charge recruitment fees for various expenses uh, from the employees. And these employees may not necessarily be always the blue collar employees. They may be employees who are at different levels of organization. Is there a threshold that we need to follow or we need to see if the level of, uh, let's say, fees which is being charged from an employee, is it uh, within the safe thresholds or if it is beyond a certain threshold, then it's going towards exploitation and uh, we then kind of classify it as the precursor for forced labor? 
Boy, thank you, uh, Kanish. That is a really good question and a really difficult one to answer. And just to just to give a little bit more of an example there, so you could imagine that a number of companies uh, might be recruiting people who are actually making pretty good salaries, right, or have pretty good jobs. That, is that what that's kind of what you're getting at, right? And then they might actually, as a service, right, pay into this um, uh, pay into this recruiting organization. And it's actually not a problem because they are in a position where they can where they can pay back that recruiting fee, right? And it, and if I understand your question, what you're saying is is that is that what we're what we're talking about here? Is that a is that a is that a problem? Is that right? Uh, to a certain extent, I mean, uh, my my problem is how do we differentiate in that continuum? Because uh, I mean, if you look at these uh, agents. They will range from one end to the other. They will charge, you know, some may charge reasonable, some may charge unreasonable, depending upon, you know, what are the uh, earnings that the potential candidate will get. So how do we make that threshold? How we do we identify that threshold that, okay, till this level, if the person is earning this much, he's being charged this much fee, this is okay, this is acceptable. Beyond this, it's, it's not okay. So how do we make that differentiation? How do we identify that threshold? Or how, I mean, what criteria do we use to kind of, uh, you know, uh, make that differentiation, yeah. whether the contractor yeah. or the agent is good or bad, so to say simply? Yeah, um, so I would invite anyone else on the call to come in who might have a, uh, a direct answer to that. My answer is going to be um, good news, uh, is going to be good news, bad news. Um, the bad news first is that there's, there's not an international standard on this that's written yet. There's no place that I can point you to the UN or the ILO where it says exactly, you know, what that, uh, what that standard, uh, what that standard is, or what that number is, that percentage is, right? Of how much is the fee versus how much does the employee earn so they can pay it back? Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that uh, there are a number of organizations and companies trying to figure this out for the first time, and they are right at the um, the threshold of what of, of that question and trying to come up with some kind of a good structure. Uh, an easy black and white rule where you can figure out, all right, is this a, a, a worker who is in a vulnerable position or not? So I would point you and, and others here to um, the IHRB. I might ask Michaela if, if you could drop that uh, uh, website in the um, in the chat window here. So IHRB and the and this and the responsible the leadership group for responsible recruitment, they have all committed to this idea of the employer pays uh, principle. But as they're doing their own investigation, um, the key question to keep in mind, well, two key questions to keep in mind. One is, are we hearing directly from the workers so that we're so that we so that we know how much they have to pay back and we know how much they actually earn. Right. If we're not talking to the workers, then we're not going to be getting some, some good answers on this. Um, and the second is that we're looking for vulnerable workers here, right? So, so adding up and saying this is how much you make on a, you know, every month, this is how much you are owed based on, based on getting here, um, and there's no way. I want to say it's something like, you know, if you can't pay it off within two months, something one, two, a very short amount of time, then that is considered to be that is considered to be um, unreasonable fees and, uh, and forced labor. I see one other hand up here, Tara Holman. Let me, let me bring you into the conversation. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, are you able to hear me? We can, yeah. Oh, super. Um, okay, I think this is a really valuable point of the discussion. So yeah, a good one yeah. to raise. Um, so obviously the, 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 employer, the employer pays principal folks, I think, are, I mean, it's definitely something that is sweeping around is becoming much more common based on the idea that the employer is benefiting from the recruitment process of finding cheaper labor, but, um, they, but therefore the idea is the employer should be responsible for all employment costs, right? So the benefit of this cheaper contract for two years is that you have to pay all the recruitment fees um, as the employer. The um, other concepts that are coming into play is whether the worker can access the service on a voluntary basis rather than being forced, right? So um, if the service is, was, was raised, you know, maybe the service really is something that's offered in the marketplace. Let's say it's transportation, right? Um, so if that transportation is something that worker needs to take, allowing the worker to make a, the voluntary selection of the transportation and, and then paying at the market rate is really critical. So sometimes what recruiters are doing is 
um, the recruitment looks free initially, but then once you get on that recruiter's bus or plane or what have you, um, then all of a sudden you're in, um, the worker could be in a situation where they're forced to pay pay for food that costs a, too much money or pay for housing that costs way above market rate. So moving um, into the looking at the services that are provided by the employer or by the recruiter, I should say, um, in that case we're looking at whether they're provided on a voluntary versus a forced basis to the worker, whether they are, uh, whether the worker is paying at the market rate or some um, higher rate, which would not be permitted. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention in response to the initial um, person that commented is I have sometimes been <laughs> drawn into this conversation about who pays, you know, with respect to high level professional technical training kinds of things. And and so I really appreciate that, you know, one of the things you have to do in those conversations, I, I consider that a little bit of a red herring, you know, that some engineer got two months training in Germany and now, you know, how long do they have to repay that if they quit their job, et cetera. Um, and, and I do want to focus on what you were pointing out already which is that we were really using these principles for vulnerable workers. So we're not talking about when an engineer gets trained in another country. We are talking about when a worker gets recruited and gets into a position that they would be hard pressed to get out of because they don't have access to a lawyer, they don't have access to protection, you know, to get them out of a, of a potential um, indentured type of situation. Um, so those are the principles I would mention, you know, employer pays all recruitment, the services are provided and accessed by workers purely on a voluntary basis and not a forced basis, and that the services um, are provided at a market rate and not a high rate. So I think all of those principles can be used in conjunction with each other. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for that detail, Tara. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, yeah, I think I think the principle going forward is, you know, let's start with the vulnerable workers. There's enough out there. There's enough problems out there with people who we know are in precarious situations. Let's investigate those first. Um, if you are investigating and you happen to find a situation where it's a, a white collar engineer who might have paid a fee, okay, worth talking to them about it. But you know, maybe it's better to focus your energy elsewhere then. Um, thank you very much for the question and dialogue. Just in the interest of time, we've got a few more issues to put onto the table, so I want to I want to keep us moving and make sure we can get through these. Um, but I'm, I'll be watching the hands over here as uh, Kanishka and Tara uh, both did. There's a little hand uh, on the top right here that you can press um, if you'd like to come in uh, to the conversation at any time. So again, child labor. Um, yeah, we we'll talked a little bit about it at the top. Uh, you know, why does child labor happen? Uh, really complicated issues, obviously, usually having to do with structural poverty in a particular country. There can be some lack of awareness about the um, about the international norms and uh, rules guiding this. Uh, but I also want to point out that a lot of it is, uh, excuse me, a lot of it is cultural uh, and and depends on where the uh, particular family is uh, is working. Sometimes I would say less in the consumer goods sector because this often appears in factories, right? There's not a lot of like traditional um, traditional culture around kids going to factories to work. Whereas if you're in an agriculture uh, context, there might be, right? This is a family farm. We've always started, you know, working on the farm when we're 10 years old, and um, and that's just the way it is. A little less so in the factory context. So. Um, you know, I think that's one where you have to interrogate that a little bit harder if you get that excuse if you if you happen to do find this this issue. Um, under the ILO, uh, children are uh, allowed to do light work between the ages of 13 to 15, um, but it's key here under the first bullet point as long as it does not threaten their health and safety or hinder their education or vocational orientation and training. Um, uh, the last one here then I think is, you know, the most obvious, the worst form of child labor, any work which is likely to jeopardize the children's physical, mental, and moral health, uh, safety, or morals should not be done by anyone under uh, the age of 18. So uh, 13 to 15 for light work, uh, between 15 and 18, um, there are some provisions where, where children can work in some, in some context, um, but then no one under 18 can do any uh, hazardous work. Um, uh, those laws are different around the world, um, and so it is important, you know, wherever you're working to, to check the local law on that, but under the guiding principles, there is this important principle that uh, if the local law requires less than the human rights norm, in this case the ILO guidance, that the company should really strive to try to live up to or implement the higher standards, so the human rights standard in this case. So 
what you end up doing in some cases is, is going above and beyond uh, local law, but that can be really hard if you're working with suppliers that say, well, hey, you know, the law says my son or daughter can work when they're age 16, um, they should be allowed to work. You could say, okay, you know, maybe in some context or maybe we could limit that, uh, the time that they're out doing some work, but, you know, under human rights principles, uh, it really should be uh, 18. A couple examples here where we uh, have seen it, um, again, cotton is a big one, but all across the value chain, right, from uh, spinning cotton to sewing and finishing in factories uh, across India and Bangladesh and other parts of the, uh, other, other primarily parts of that part of the world. Um, one uh, investigation, uh, the second bullet point here, uh, recently discovered 60% of the workers in yarn and spinning mills uh, in India were under 18 when they started working there. Um, and up to uh, 20,000 children are estimated to work in, uh, in mica mines in uh, India, which is a really um, important um, uh, metal for uh, cosmetics um, and paints and, and, uh, and construction equipment. Uh, but I know the, the makeup industry, the beauty industry is really focused on this particular issue right now, uh, and it's a really big problem um, in, uh, in India in that particular supply chain. All right, um, you know, some of these questions we've already gone through here, what do you do if you, if you find a worker, a child worker? Uh, well, that's a different question around remedy, but these are just getting to the question. So is there a discrepancy between national laws and relevant international standards? Are children working on the site below 18? Are children working on the site receiving adequate schooling or education? Um, and given that children are often employed by their parents, do they have access to grievance mechanisms and receive remediation? In many cases, you know, the, the children's parents are their grievance mechanism, um, but that, uh, you know, so it's very difficult to try to think through, like how does a grievance mechanism actually work for a, uh, for a child? Um, what do you do though if you find, if you find child labor? Um, it's not one where you immediately uh, cut, sort of immediately cut them off or immediately say, all right, everybody, you know, like go home. That can cause a lot of problems for a family that might be living at the poverty level and the kids might not have a place to go. They might not have a school to go to. They might be providing an important source of um, revenue. So there's some really good work um, that's been done. I would, I would point here to um, some work that Coca-Cola has done on child labor trying to empower uh, their parents through job skills and uh, training programs and other vocational skills to try to um, bring in more income for the family so that they're not as reliant on kids. Uh, we'll see later the um, Tony, Cho uh, Tony Chocoloni, which is a company, a chocolate company that we'll talk about. Um, they do a lot of work educating the community to say, hey, it's, like I was saying earlier, it's okay if you work a little bit on the farm uh, but not, uh, but not extensively. So, you know, raising awareness and trying to understand each particular situation where there might be kids working um, is is really important. And trying to work with others if you can uh, is, is also good. That's what we saw in Uzbekistan, and we've seen again more progress in Uzbekistan than on some uh, in some areas uh, where there where there are children. Let me pause once again and just see before we move into working conditions. Any comments or thoughts on? On, uh, on child labor, does anyone have any experience trying to figure out what to do if you find child labor in your supply chain? I'll go on pause here for just a second. Great, okay, we've got a couple more issues to put on the table here, um, working conditions. So broadly, working conditions, um, you know, right to a decent workplace is specifically articulated in the Universal Declaration, so that is a human rights issue. Uh, we've laid out here what, what, the, what the typical working conditions are that, that, raise, um, that raise human rights issues. One is how many hours do you work, right? Making sure that, that uh, rest periods are provided, that the, um, that the uh, that people are not forced to work more than eight hours uh, per day. That's the, that's the ILO guidance. Uh, remuneration is uh, making sure that they're paid well uh, and more importantly, or paid fairly, sorry. Uh, and then more importantly, uh, paid for overtime, uh, which, is, which is a way that a lot of uh, employers will get around, uh, you know, get more work for people and not pay them. 
Um, you may have heard of this concept of a living wage. That's something that at BSR we uh, we push. I think BCTA is also um, trying to uh, trying to work with companies that are open to paying a living wage and understanding what a living wage is. Uh, that's great. That's best practice. At a very minimum, the requirement is to pay the local minimum wage. Contract status. I mentioned um, you know trying to make sure that everybody has a contract there. It's also worth looking at benefits to permanent and temporary workers. We've seen a number of cases where people are working in a factory and half of the people in the factory are employees, and so they get good social benefits, healthcare benefits, uh, usually a higher wage. But there are contract workers working right next to them doing exactly the same job, and they have no benefits, uh, no health care, and often paid a lower wage. Um, now, that's legal in many countries to have contract seasonal temporary workers, but it's important to think about what the particular situation is or what that particular case might be um, uh, and to ask whether it's fair or not. Um, are these, you know, are the contract workers there for a long time? Are they only there for a month or two, which is usually okay, but if they are there for a year or two or three or they are actually in practice working as real employees but the company is not giving them those benefits, that might be a situation where you as a company, you know, want to say, hey, we're not really happy with this uh, contractor worker arrangement, uh, let's take a look at it. Health and safety, so physical working conditions, factory, the workplace, the conditions of the dorm, uh, hygienic facilities, um, whether medical care is provided on site or there's access to medical care, particularly in heavy manufacturing. Uh, mental conditions, so machine noise leads to stress, verbal bullying, any kind of harassment uh, in the workplace, those are all going to be human rights issues. Free association, collective bargaining is a human right, uh, and there are ways to do that even in countries that might prohibit um, uh, uh, unions or, or workers from organizing. I want to move through these relatively quickly. Uh, interesting report, China Labor Watch uh, keeps their eye on uh, labor issues. Um, and have been doing so for a long time in China and published a number of good investigative reports. This one called out Amazon for, um, you know, working with a uh, Foxconn supplier where uh, there were a number of uh, uh, seasonal workers uh, in, in the workforce who were treated substantially different from regular employees and, uh, you know, given um, conditions and payment that was not up to speed or not up to, uh, certainly not up to standards with their peers and not up to international human rights standards. Not to call out Amazon here, it happens to a lot of different companies, but more just to say China Labor Watch is a good one, uh, a good organization to just keep an eye on if you're looking for, if you're doing any sourcing from China, take a look at their material and it might even be worth getting on the phone with them uh, to say, hey, you know, I'm in this industry, uh, working in this part of the country, uh, what do you know there? Uh, so there are a lot of publicly available resources uh, resources available for this. Good. Uh, what can uh, what can you do here? Right. What kinds of questions can you ask? Um, so how many of the business partners are permanent versus temporary? How many workers are on temporary contracts? Uh, are workers employed through other companies, a labor broker or a labor agency? We talked about that in the context of forced labor. And then looking specifically at minimum wage, right? Uh, that's going to be very important. Are people paid enough for the work that they're doing? Are they paid equally uh, based on gender? Uh, and so, you know, good to ask. Good to ask those uh, those questions. All right. I think we're coming into our uh, last couple of issues here on bribery and corruption. Um, and Actually, then one more on women's empowerment. I'm going to work through these uh, relatively quickly. Bribery and corruption, you might be saying, hey, wait a second. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a human right to be free from bribery and corruption. Technically, you're right. You don't have that right. But what we're starting to learn and what we've known for a long time is that bribery and corruption are often tied to other human rights violations. So um, in, in, uh, in situations in countries where there is a lot of bribery and corruption, we can often bet that there's going to be uh, a lot of other human rights violations too. So, um, you know, this third bullet point here I think explains it well. Corruption is a structural obstacle to the enjoyment of human rights and disproportionate affects vulnerable communities, uh, often by misdirecting funds that could be spent on healthcare, education, or other public goods and preventing participation in the democratic process. Um, there are a number of uh, legal cases. We talked about this during our, our 101 training last week. Uh, legal cases where um, 
uh, smaller suppliers deeper in the supply chain of big multinational companies uh, can get in trouble, um, uh, in, at least under U.S. law, U.K. law, uh, for paying bribes. And the big companies who are doing business with them can get in trouble uh, for doing business with somebody who's paying, who's paying bribes. Um, so, that is, uh, so that's important, and this is one where you know, it's often a legal issue uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to leave uh, these statistics for you to check out on your own. Um, basically just saying that, you know, it's not just big companies that are involved in, in bribery and corruption, also small, small companies uh, and, you know, all over the world um, are also involved in bribery and corruption. So that's an important one where often if you are a smaller company supplying to a big company, they will want to see a compliance program on bribery and corruption in place um, uh, and, and will want to know that this is, uh, this is well managed. All right, women's empowerment. Excuse me. It's the last area that we wanted to uh, focus on, and we wanted to point you here to the uh, women's empowerment principles, which are a, a set of principles that are drafted for business um, to um, that 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 uh, that are being that businesses are being asked to commit to in order to help provide a, a you know an empowering platform for women in the workplace specifically. So. Um, uh, you know, just to call out a couple here that are anchored in human rights issues and rights and non-discrimination, women and men are treated fairly at work um, and also, uh, most importantly, paid fairly and paid equally uh, for the work that they are doing. Um, there has been some movement among, uh, primarily in the UK and France and other parts of Europe, to require companies to disclose and conduct investigations about gender pay equity. Um, so uh, that that is uh, this is certainly in line with the uh, with what we're seeing the legislator do, um, promoting health and safety, well-being in the workplace, providing education, training, and professional development, uh, in implementing practices that empower women. Um, lots of opportunity to uh, to get involved here. Um, the case study that uh, that we've got um, our first case study is on a, a company that we actually spoke to as part of our um, as part of developing this training, Afropads. So they provide uh, environmentally friendly sanitary pads to women uh, at an affordable price, and they're reusable, uh, and they do a lot of workplace training around, um, uh, around providing these products and other uh, healthcare products that are focused on, uh, on, on women. Uh, and so, um, you know, really trying to move beyond just, uh, you know, beyond just, just, just uh, you know, recognize that there's a fundamental problem here with access to healthcare services and um, and uh, and equipment, and uh, and providing that to women uh, in the supply chain, so that they are able to um, you know con you know continue uh, working. Uh, one of the big problems that we found through our Her Project uh, work, which is which is another site that I would point you to, is that um, you know once a month uh, half the, you know the workforce would leave and they didn't necessarily need to and they'd be uh, women because they didn't have proper access to education or pro uh, access to um, to sanitary pads um, and would uh, would not be able to come to work and so this is again empowering women and and good for the business as well um, Another company here, uh, this is a, uh, a textile company in Turkey that is focused on bringing women into the workforce um, and, uh, and empowering them in their own work and making sure that there are an equal number of women who are employed uh, at, the, uh, at the factory. Um, just in the interest of time, I want to pause on our last slide here and then, and then leave a couple minutes if there's any questions or comments. Um, this is a, a company called Tony's Chocoloni, uh, which is really fun to say, uh, as well as from what I understand, they make really good chocolate, but they are, uh, their, their entire business is tied to making chocolate free from uh, child labor and forced labor. Um, and not only their chocolate, but they're trying to get the, uh, all chocolate makers to, to come on board with these principles and, um, and, uh, and, and, and get forced labor and modern slavery and child labor out of the chocolate supply chain. Uh, if you go to their website, uh, they've got a ton of good information about what they're doing. Uh, the three ways that they describe that they are trying to do this. One, create awareness among farming communities. So I've talked about this. It's fine for children to help out on the farm sometimes, but it's important to know where to draw the line. Um, you know, they have to know that heavy lifting is harmful to children. Other hazardous work is harmful to children. So, you know, doing some awareness there and making sure that they're 
uh, farmers in their supply chain know what that line is. Uh, that's really important. Leading by example here is investing in long-term partnerships with farmer cooperatives and paying cocoa farmers a higher price. So there is a premium to make sure that they are paid well uh, and, are, and, and have a decent income, that they're not stuck in some kind of structural uh, situation that leads to poverty. Uh, and then inspiring others, right? Looking for partnerships and looking for other companies and NGOs and government actors who are willing to work with them on uh, education and, uh, and piloting programs uh, to, help, to help their farmers. They track the impact that they have on their uh, website. They, I think the statistic is they paid over 900,000 euros of uh, sort of premium wages to farmers to make sure that they have a decent living wage. So um, they've got some really good quantitative um, impacts on, uh, on, on how they're helping folks. So um, a good example of how a company can manage human rights and uh, do, a, uh, do a really good job uh, with their business and make a really tasty product in this case. Um, so good, let me uh, pause there and just invite any other questions as long as we have a couple minutes on the line. Feel free to raise your hand or just take yourself off mute and, uh, and come into the conversation. Okay, very good. Well, let's close a minute early and make sure that folks can uh, can get to whatever meetings they have. Thank you for the uh, discussion earlier. I found that uh, very enlightening. Really appreciate uh, folks jumping in. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining. We will post the recording of this webinar and the slide deck um, on the Business Call to Action website very shortly. We will be back on Thursday for a discussion around financial services uh, companies and human rights issues in the financial services sector. If you'd like to join us for that, you are welcome uh, to do so. And please spread the word about these webinars. We're trying to get as many people as we can to hear them. And again, made available online afterwards if you can't make it. So thank you very much for joining. Thanks, Michaela and Nazila uh, from the Business Call to Action for joining, and Michaela from BSR for getting us started this morning. Uh, and I hope you, everyone has a great day wherever in the world you may be off to. So we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.